because my focus was what could I use in shows, I learned a lot of pieces of lots of things. Hey there, you're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 484, with today's guest, Mr. Teal James Glenn. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick, and everything we do here is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we do, check out whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's the place to find our store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15%. Martial Arts Radio gets its own website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week. And the goal here at Whistlekick is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, there are a number of ways you can help by making a purchase, sharing an episode, following our social media, telling your friends, picking up Amazon books, leaving reviews, or supporting the Patreon. If you think the new shows we're releasing are worth 63 cents a piece, not to mention all the back episodes you get access to, consider supporting us at $5 a month by visiting patreon.com slash whistlekick and signing up. And if you do, guess what? You're going to get even more stuff. We've got exclusive content there that nobody else gets to see or hear or watch. One of my favorite things about talking to martial artists is that they take their martial arts out into the world and they incorporate it in different ways. And today's guest is one of the best examples, if not the best example, I've ever seen of that. With an extensive acting resume and a ton of books to his credit, not to mention all the martial arts he actually trains, Mr. Teal James Glenn exemplifies training and training for life. I had a fantastic time talking to him, and I know you're going to have a fantastic time listening to our conversation. Good morning. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I was certain that I was going to blow up the house or something. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a first. Yeah. Well, that, to, to my knowledge, in uh, I mean, this is going to be episode, I think, 482. Yeah. I don't think we've had any... Uh, casualty or or, lo- or loss boom and that was the end of the show <laughs> how are you doing i'm doing well and yourself I'm good i'm good uh, i'm uh, generally a late night person so you're getting me on the flip side <laughs> oh oh well i i appreciate that i appreciate your your willing to, willingness to be I, I, flexible I'm being asked to, to chat it's nice to yeah meet people yeah well you've you've done some interesting stuff you know, yeah. I often tell people it seems much more interesting on paper than it was to live through. But yeah, ultimately, I guess it is, you know, yeah. is, is that and, and I think we could probably make that claim about just about anything that to experience it, you know, it's it's incremental. But then when we we take a step back and we look at it, you know, obviously you're you don't write out the 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 gaps, you don't write out the time, you don't say I did this thing and then, you know. Four yeah. weeks later or six years later, I did this other thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's true. I mean, I actually, um, I do a thing where many years ago, because I have imposter syndrome and I always have like type A plus plus personality, I always think I didn't do enough. But I st- one New Year's, I look back at my year and went, oh man, I didn't do anything this year. And a friend of mine said, are you nuts? You did this, this, this. So I start, I have a journal where anything of any, um, professional consequence I write down. So in those periods where I'm feeling like I'm not doing anything, I can look back and go, Oh, in February I did this, 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 I finished that. I started that. Oh, okay. I guess I wasn't sleeping the whole damn month. And (laughs) it helps it, you know, it becomes a, a physical symbol that I wasn't just watching episodes of Perry Mason late at night. Mm. You know, is, do you find your, your type a, plus personality in conflict with the creative side of what you do? I've kind of harnessed it. I, okay. I, guess I, I, I technically sort of have a, an addictive personality in that if I, if I like something, I tend to leap into it completely. And so I've tried to harness that with working out, with um, finishing projects. I'm very big on finishing stuff that I start. If I, if I happen to start a, a novel or a short story, and I have to do something else because of a deadline and I don't get to finish it. It's like a little elf sitting on my shoulder whispering, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And it, um, 
So I get back to it because I have a lot of friends who have many projects they've begun and then kind of petered out on. And I tend to try and really push through to finish. It's why I've done 31 novels. Um, say, say that again, 31 novels? Yeah. And, and like, I don't know, nine or 10 collections of short stories. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't think I've, you know, I, I think of some of the, the most famous writers that I know, and I don't know that, you know, like, I don't know that Stephen King's written 31 novels. Oh, no, he has. And Has he? And, okay. And uh, like Isaac Asimov wrote 200. William Gibson wrote over 200 just shadow novels. Uh, wow. So, um, I mean, mind you, you know, they're, they're not like, I mean, was it um, J.R.R. Martin has written, I don't know, maybe 10, and it takes him like two decades to write a freaking novel. Um, you know well, the, well, the game of thrones fans out there are, are nodding along as you say well, that well people forget he's also written a pile of short stories he was the story editor for the twilight zone reboot in the 80s he has a lot of work it's just not as a nom as novels but sure. um yeah i keep a record of all my book submissions and short stories going back to 1977 and i had to number them so I can keep track of them. So I have I have 464 manuscripts um, that I've written to date that are you know projects I've begun and I would say I've finished all but maybe five of them, at, you know at some point. So, um, are there any commonalities? Um, generally speaking, adventure. Generally speaking, uh, I'm I try. Uh, to have a positive view in my characters. I don't like, for instance, I, I'm, I don't like lionizing villains. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't like the trend where you take some heinous character from literature or make up your own and then build a show or a, a series around them. <clears throat> because to me, that's, uh, it's one thing to understand your villain it's another to make the villain the sympathetic character. To me, that's a, that's a cop-out. It allows you to do morally anything and justify it. You know, I, mm. I guess I'm much more traditional that way. I, I believe in good versus evil. Sure. You know, sure. Um, so I'm very it, I, in that sense. As you say that, it's bringing to mind, from my experience, the, the most recent, uh, at least my most recent experience with, with that kind of a character being the Joker movie. Oh, I, 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 I think it's a movie that never should have been made, primarily because, A, the Joker exists because Batman exists. So to do him in isolation is really only half an experience. And the other is he should always be a little mysterious. I mean, one version of the Joker had him being the guy in the red hood, um, who was a criminal, but we never really knew about that criminal's background. We just knew he fell into a vat of stuff and went wackadoodle. Um, I think it needs to be that. I think to basically the Joker movie was just Taxi Driver meets Bozo. Um, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> that that is um, it's succinct, but at the same time, possibly the the most apt description. Yeah, I mean, literally, I, he's uh, even to the point. Of, Every time I used to see the trailer of him running, he's like, I don't know, running away from something in the trailer. He looks like Bozo running because he's got the right. full hair and the whole thing. And I'm like, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, that the basically he recreated the 80s. He even put De Niro in it. So it's very much right. Taxi Driver. I mean, he, he uh, you know, he said he lionized that director and he lionized that film. And uh, I'm like, uh, you know, it's like when they, they turned Dracula into a romantic hero back in the eighties. Like he's a giant mosquito. You know, he feeds on us. <laughs> How is that romantic? You know? Um, so um, on the other hand, you know, I, I don't mind really understanding a villain. I, I don't under, I don't mind because every villain thinks he's a hero in my career as an actor. I've only played bad guys. I have never been cast as a good guy in 42 years as an actor. Um, so, um, and every villain thinks they're a hero in their own story. So I do understand that. I just don't think we need to hear their story because 
you know, at one point there were three cannibal TV series on television. I'm finding these two facts very interesting. The fact that you, you're, you're not in your own literary efforts exploring villains at the depth that, that is popular today and yet being cast exclusively as a villain. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, well, I'm, I'm six foot six and 270 pounds. Um, uh, for most of my career, I had dark hair. Now I have s- silver hair. So uh, now I, I au- am often the boss of goons. Um, and uh, also I do, I don't know, 20 or 30 different accents. So I have been goons from various countries. Now I'm the boss of goons from various countries. Um, but um, I just intimidate a lot of um, casting directors um, and very often the actors that are cast as heroes are like five eight, five nine, um, pretty people. And so it's easy to go, okay, yeah, the giant, he'll be the killer. And, you know, I can do it. So I can tap into my Celtic rage when I need to be a bad guy. Um, <laughs> it's kind of biblical in a sense. Yeah, really, you know, very, very, you know, I beware of Jewish guys with little stones. They're scary, um, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> But you know, also I do the physical stuff. So often I'm I'm hired um, for a fight scene, and then they discover I can do more dialogue, and they, and my character gets bigger. Um, and um, or they'll hire me for for some dialogue scene and discover that I can do the physicality, and they'll add it in. I mean, you know, less so of course as I get older. But that's you know that's been I go back and forth between you know saying lines and falling down on a regular basis. Those physical skills, if, if anybody takes a look at the things on your acting resume or, or you know, just the, the differences in the roles that you've played, they're quite diverse. And I'm curious where, well, two pieces, and, and I hope we get through as much of it as we can, because uh, there's a lot there. And, and, you know, obviously there are time limitations, but when did, when did that start and how did you end up doing so many different things? Well, I started... I, um, I was a very sickly kid uh, growing up, and um, and of course, naturally, when you're really sick, I had you know asthma and hay fever, uh, and I was like tall and skinny. Um, and of course, when you're that way, the first thing you do is decide you want to be a superhero. So um, I fell in love with the old movie serials, The Adventures of Captain Marvel, um, Spy Smasher, um, and when I was 14. I saw chapter two of the adventures of Captain Marvel at a comic book convention. Uh, I was already into the comics and and superheroes and discovered Doc Savage and physical culture at that point. And I saw this incredible stunt work in, you know, the perfect blending of the actor and the stunt man and the special effects to make Captain Marvel do these heroic things. And I went, I want to do that. So I made super eight movies. I taught myself how to do stair falls by falling down the marble stairs in my, my high school. Um, I used to run super eight film of the old serials and frame by frame, look at how the stunt men fell and moved. And then I read everything I could on them. And so I started to teach myself, I couldn't run, but I could jump off a garage roof because I knew how to build a box rig. And, um, I, I didn't have the wind for, say, a long fight scene in the real world, but I could do a choreographed scene. And um, so that actually is that. And I have to say, when I was, I guess I would have been about eight, maybe, or nine, I discovered the first issue of Judo Master Comics. And it opened up the world of martial arts to me. It was like, wow, this is a person who can make himself do this stuff. I discovered even before I discovered Doc Savage. So, um, and that's what got me into start to reading about martial arts and then getting into it. So, um, and you know, once you, anybody who's like a dojo rat, you know, when you go from one thing to another, physical skills translate. You know, you can, you know, you, know, you can learn to juggle because you have the eye-hand coordination and then you can learn to do tumbling and then you can, um, for me, the sword was sort of the, the thing that opened up the world to me. I took a, a class called Swashbuckling 101, oddly enough, 
um, with a guy named Mom Beauregard. And it was to research a book I was working on. And the minute I held the sword in my hand, I knew that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And so I started to train myself to be in shape to do the staged combat with the sword. And then from there, everything else came. So that's, I guess, even though the Duo Master was the first hint that I could make myself into something, when I held the sword, it really um, kind of transported me into the next level of this nonsense. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I still get just as excited holding a sword in my hand as I did the first time 40 something years ago. I really do. Um, Does it matter what kind of sword? Generally not. I, I, I love, they never let me do court sword because I'm so big, but I really love court sword because it's delicate and it's, it's pretty. But I love katana. I love horn. I love dao, uh, gin, a- anything. It, it, you know, I, and I, you know, I've studied knife. I have, uh, I have a practice kukri that I work out with. Um, you know, it, to me, it's, it's all this beautiful ballet of death. Um, and it all translates into unarmed and it, it's just, I don't know. Um, I find it. Uh, and of course the romance of the concept of a chevalier of a knight of one of the reasons when I took what I know, one of the things that what I know were called were the Knights of Korea and the concept that you could be a better person. And if, to get your black belt in, in what you had to write a poem or paint a picture, or do a dance. And because the concept was to, you weren't just a fighter, you were a warrior, which means you had to have other civilized skills. And I love that concept. And to me, the, the sword embodies that, in theory. I mean, not in the reality of the world, you were just, a lot of them were just thugs with pointy things. But um, I like that concept of being a better person and a complete person not just a fighter. There's an old saying that um, in peacetime, a fighter is a liability. But in peacetime, a warrior is a doctor or a farmer or uh, a singer um, that the skills translate. You know? So to mm. me, that's, that's part of it is to be a complete person, an artist, a writer. Or, you know. One thing I'm not as a singer, thank God, that... That, that might almost be too much talent <laughs> well it might it might be if i was successful at them all that that could be but um yeah, you know i think doing a lot of things allows you to see i think people who do only one thing get a, a narrow view of, of that thing and it actually makes them weaker at it i think a certain amount of generalism allows you to see whatever your passion is from a different angle and so you can always improve it um, i'm a better writer because i'm an artist i'm a better artist because i'm an actor i'm a better actor because i'm uh, a fighter i'm a better fighter because i'm an artist uh, and to me they all they allow me to see it from a slightly different angle and, and not have a one point of view mm. as you're talking about this concept of the warrior and having value even in peacetime that concept is very much at odds with a a subset and i have no idea how, how big it is but a subset in the traditional martial arts community who have really pushed hard into this self-defense and physical application is all that matters and if it's not relevant to those scenarios then it's not worth training well yeah i mean that's that's the, the, the Krav Magra um, concept um, in, in a society like, say, Israel, that is essentially always under attack. Um, they have to come up with something that's quick and dirty and effective, and they don't really want to lay philosophy on it. They don't have time for that because their society is being immediately attacked. Um, but ultimately, if, you, if your society is no longer being immediately attacked and you have a bunch of people whose only solution to things is to punch, stab, and kick, you can't actually ever build a society, a civilized society. 
So there's, there's a great book called The Way of the Warrior. And it, it, um, it goes through various warrior cultures. And ultimately, it, it states that the, the purpose of the warrior is to make themselves obsolete. Mm. That's a p- pretty powerful concept. Yeah, to, to create a concept of a society where they're no longer needed. Because all warriors are outsiders. You can't be a member of your society if your only thing is killing. You're not invited to parties um, because you'd be the only one. <laughs> you know, John Wick does not get a lot of dinner invitations. Um, but um, and and their concept is that ultimately Tai Chi um, is the ultimate martial art in that it takes your enemies. Uh, aggression and turns it on them and in theory makes them part of you. Um, it, it, uh, it converts aggression into uh, coexistence. And um, to me, that's, I mean, again, it's a philosophical concept because ultimately, you know, you want to have an army that can shoot and blow up stuff. But, I mean, that's the whole concept in, in the United States, in theory, of, of a civilian army. We don't have a large core of professional fighters. Athens didn't have a large core of professional fighters like Sparta did. Yet Athens actually won most battles that they dealt with with Sparta. Sparta had one view. And because of that, they couldn't think outside the box. They couldn't adapt. They couldn't think about the next battle. It was, it was each individual battle. And I think, um, I mean, I think, yeah, and if, if you want to take martial arts as a defense thing, yeah, MMA. Um, but even, even Rory Gracie, that he was, uh, I was looking at a video recently, he talks about the fact that if you want to take self-defense, competition jujitsu isn't the thing because you can't do all the stuff you need to do in self-defense. You know, you can't gouge eyes. You can't bite throats out. You can't, you know, rip off testicles. Um, when I trained in Hwarang Do, uh, my instructor was the head of the Solar Military Academy at one point. And um, early on, he said, now, if there's, you know, any of you, at that point, we weren't doing competitions at all. Hwarang Do was not a competition art because it was too deadly. And he said, if you want to train for competition, you know, step over here and we will, we will train differently. Um, and if, but if you want to take what I know as a war art, <clears throat> then, you know, we do it this way. Cause you know, we, we had white belt techniques where you literally were ripping parts of people off and you can't do that in a competition. Well, you could do it once, but then they, they take you away to prison. Um, so, um, you know, the sport aspect of it, the health aspect of it was very different. And, uh, and that's something you have to do is you have to think, well, am I taking this for this reason? For me, I, for me, it's, uh, I mean, I always took martial arts. For me, it was always about what I could do in film with it, what I could do on stage with it. So I, I, uh, I would learn the real technique and then say, well, how could I make this work in a fight scene in Romeo and Juliet? Um, so that was my focus. But, um, at the same time, you know, I bounced in a biker bar. So I also, I wasn't about to do, you know, stage slaps if I had to be in a fight. So I had to learn the other stuff. Um, and uh, although I, I imagine they would laugh hysterically if I was doing fake fights to myself, um, you know. Um, so I think it's, you know, that, that subset of the community is perfectly legit. But, you know, it's, it's at that point, it's not martial arts. It's fighting arts. Mm. It's or it's it's pure combat, you know. Right. And there there is a difference. I mean, if you look at competition fencing now, it really has very little relationship to a sword fight in 1850. I mean, there's almost no connection because they have taken the lethality out. Well, even boxing, as as effective as boxing is. They have taken most of the lethality out of it. They give them bigger gloves. They can't hit certain places. You can't use your elbows or your forehead, which are, they used to call the third fist, you know, 
Um, you can't kick people in the shins and then, you know, hit them in the throat. So there's, they've taken as much lethality out of boxing as possible, even though it's still, you know, you're violently smacking your people's heads and stuff. Um, but it's not as lethal as street boxing at all. Um, they have removed the lethality for the sake of being able to repeat things and not cripple everybody every single match. So, um, you know, it, it, it means, you know, what do you come to? I, I love the fact that like in, in, in the Filipino arts, you learn weapons first because the concept of the Filipino arts is um, if you if you get killed in the first year of taking our stuff, you never learn the really deep stuff. So we're going to give you the really lethal stuff to start with. And then we'll teach you the subtle stuff later on. And, and what I know has some of that, the, the, you know, I said our white belt techniques were pretty, pretty aggressive um, because the idea was we, we want you to be around to learn the deep philosophical, philosophical stuff, you know, in a couple of years. Um, and um, I think, you know, it, it's, it's just what you bring to it. If you want to do, a, you know, if you want to do competition, then um, you're learning it with a different focus than if you, you're, you know, living on the street somewhere and you know you're going to need to fight somebody to the death anytime soon. You know, that's something that, um, you know, it's a different, different focus. You've mentioned Huarang Do a few times, so I'm wondering: is would, would you call that your your principal art, or the one you've spent the most time with? Maybe That's the one we spent the most formal time with. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I I'm kind of a dojo rat or dojang rat in that um, I'll train with anybody in anything, um, and maybe that makes me a slaughter slut. I'm not sure, um, but um, that's the one that I studied the most formally for seven years, um, and. Um, with one of the reasons I think I did is it's an incredibly versatile art. Each level is um, feels like a different art because uh, there's grappling levels and kicking levels and punching levels and um, uh, there's a soft hard level, there's a pure hard level um, and uh, part of it is because one of the tenants in it is that when you reach black belt of a certain degree, you're required to go to another art, learn it to black belt level and bring it back into Huarengo. So, I mean, like, um, one of the black belt forms is how to clear your pistol. Um, uh, so it's, it, it used a lot of all the other things I had learned. I suddenly felt comfortable with it because it had, all of these different things that I was learning and other stuff. Cause I, I mean, I, I don't know if I got exactly, you know, Marshall ADD, but um, because my focus was what could I use in shows, I learned a lot of pieces of lots of things. Um, I had the advantage when I got into it as my, my, uh, my good friend and ultimately my, my uh, instructor, uh, Michael Brown uh, had been a black belt earlier and, uh, when his master went away, he didn't train in any other arts, so there was a gap. And then when master came back, he was retraining, and the older black belt style was much rougher than what was currently being taught. And um, I got to be his uki. So I actually kind of, on the receiving end, learned a lot of the, the heavier black belt stuff from the older school uh, while he was practicing to regain his black belt. He's now a master. Um, and as is, he has schools down in Cincinnati. Um, but, um, so I had the advantage of, of almost learning it at two different levels, you know, my own level, which was, they had somewhat softened it for America. So, you know, cause you could only, you couldn't break as many people here as you could at the Seoul military Academy. Um, sure. and, sure. um, and then his, which had been really hardcore old school stuff. Um, which is, you know, I, I, I tend to take a lot of abuse, which is why I worked as a stuntman. Um, so I, I didn't complain a lot. Um, uh, 
And so I got to, you know, I, yeah, I could be in a heavy wrist lock where somebody else might be screaming and I would be like uncomfortable, but I was like, I'd be in my mind going, Oh, that's where you put the pressure on that nerve. Oh, that's cool. Um, you know, so, uh, it made, it made me, plus I'm big. So people like to practice on me because they figure oh, I can take down the giant and I can fight the guy in the bar. That's good. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Have you ever had an experience in, in a fight scene, some kind of film work, stage work, where you really wanted to take the techniques or the fight scene in a different direction than maybe the, the stunt or fight coordinator did? You ever have a, dis, a disagreement in I've, that way? I've been, I've, I've, when I've worked for other people, there are oftentimes I thought, well, I wouldn't do this, uh, or I wouldn't teach this, so I, I you know. But... Um, when you're hired, you do what they say, unless you're absolutely certain it will lead to pain, uh, you know, to um, the actor being hurt. <clears throat> I mean, I've, I've done stuff where um, I used to work for Alan Suddeth, who did a lot of the New York soap operas, ones in Fights or Us. And um, um, there was one actor on One Life to Live that if you were in a fight scene with him, you were going to get tagged. He just couldn't do choreography and he would lose it and he would hit you. And so anytime there was a fight scene coming up, it'd be a case of, okay, who are we going to sacrifice to Sparky? Um, and you know, you're a stuntman, you can't hit the actor back. So you kind of, you know, it's coming and you just kind of take it. Um, and it wasn't like the guy was necessarily doing it maliciously. He just couldn't get it, you know? Um, many actors get into it emotionally and they can't separate that, you know, this is a technique that needs to be learned, not an emotional experience. Well, apparently that was the case with the Joker film. You know, there's a number of articles online about him improvising his fight scene. And you don't improvise fight scene because then it's a real fight. And, um, so uh, can, can we unpack that a little more? Because for those of us who haven't, spent time in, in structured fights? Well, basically, a, a, a choreographed fight is, uh, I mean, Hamlet has to win his fight every night. Um, if you just let two actors fight, sometimes Hamlet would lose, and then the play doesn't work. Mm. So uh, fights have to be choreographed like a dance, very much like a dance. Um, which is why Bruce Lee was so good at it on screen. He was a cha-cha champion. Um, and um, it's choreographed very much, even unarmed, same as with sword. It's choreographed in beats. Um, it reaches a crescendo. It has a, a climax. Preferably, there's some kind of a twist toward the end of the fight where you think one's going to win and the other does. So it actually has to have a story every fight. And... Um, the fight choreographer's job is to first make it safe. Secondly, tell the story that you need to tell. And if possible, allow the actor to create his character in the fight. People fight the way they think and the way they are emotionally. Jason Bourne, for instance, would fight very differently than um, a 50 year old overweight guy who suddenly is terrified because his daughter is being raped and he has to leap in and he has no physical skills. It would be a very different fight than Mr. In Shape, Jason Bourne or, or John Wick. So you have to tell the story. You have to make it safe for the actors. And, and as I said, some actors don't get it. So the stuntmen who are the professionals often have to absorb that punishment. They have to like realize that the actor doesn't understand how to pull the punch or um, is not always going to be on, him. you know, he's not always going to be exactly where he needs to be throwing the punch and there might be real energy in it. And if there's real energy in it and you're in the way, you're going to get hit. You know, I mean, um, there's a the story that um, still, and I, I just saw this interview with Stallone on, on El Rey. Um, in the director's chair, he was talking about the fact that in Rocky IV, 
he had Dolph Lundgren. Now, Dolph Lundgren is, you know, a Kyoko Shinkai black belt and a kickboxer. And so they're in the ring, and, he, and Stallone said to him at one point, okay, um, we've got all the choreographed stuff. Let's do a sequence where you just unload on me so we can actually get the, the, the glove hitting into me and stuff. And Dolph was like, I don't think that's a good idea. And he's like, no, no, I box. It's okay. Go away. And so Dolph unloaded on him and bruised the lining of his heart. He was in the hospital for four days. Um, and, um, you know, because he wanted, quote, the realism. And the realism was <laughs> if Dolph had continued for another like 30 seconds or a minute, he would have killed him. Um, so, you know, it's, there's, there's a point. <laughs> there's just a point where it's like, no, this isn't a real fight. Let's not really hit each other. Um, I would imagine that as long as you've been doing this, you, you talked about one particular actor that you knew if you worked with him, you were going to take a shot. Yeah. That happened with a number of different actors, actually, at various points. You could tell what about the rehearsal that this guy wasn't going to get it, and so you kind of just sucked it up. <laughs> you know? But what about the other end of the spectrum? Were there actors that you found really took to it and did well and you enjoyed working with them? Oh, my gods, yes. Um, preferably actors who have dance background. I worked with a, a, a woman. Um, uh, I did a movie called Jersey Justice where she beat me up in it. Uh, Maria Sikor, great actress, really sweet woman. And she's um, Apache and, uh, and, and uh, Filipino. And um, we had, uh, she was training for another movie that she did with Wesley Snipes. And she came to me to do some knife training. <laughs> and I looked her in the eye and said, my dear, you are the block of granite. The statue's already in there. I just have to unleash your genetic heritage. And we trained for a couple days, and she was really good. She just took to it like that. Um, uh, same thing, I, I, I've had a dancer. I had a dancer. I did the, um, the Scarlet Pimpernel, the musical. And the lead who was the Pimpernel uh, had a ballet background. And I was able to, in a very short time, do really complex blade work with him. And, and actually, the best is I, I choreographed the Three Musketeers um, at West Point. They have, West Point has the most amazing theater. It's, you, could, you could fit the whole student body in there, which means you could, you could house a Zeppelin in it. It is so huge. And it, it Broadway level in terms of, all the technical stuff with platforms and all those And um, it was me and two other choreographers. We had six hours to choreograph the show. And um, each of us took a musketeer, choreographed their fights. And then there were a couple of blended fights. We're like, okay, you do the Milady fight, you do this one. So in that six hours of rehearsal time, which is a very, very short amount of time, normally for a show, um, certainly something like the Three Musketeers, you would have 50 hours. Um, but in this case, uh, all of the participants, all of the actors and actresses were cadets, which means they were the smartest, the most physically active. Um, they were cadets playing cadets, when you think about it, because they were playing the Musketeers. And we could show them one technique once, and they got it. So if the next war is choreographed, we are going to win. <laughs> amazing. And in six hours, we did, you know, maybe 50 or 60 hours worth of choreography time. And they, I mean, we showed it to them once. They did it once. If there was a correction we made, the correction was made, and that was it. We were on, and they were, they were exquisite. So, yeah. What would you chalk that up to? Uh, well, because that, that sounds really atypical. Well, it is atypical, but they were, um, you know, 18 to 20-year-olds, 20 21-year-olds who were in peak physical condition, who were all intellectually superior, because you don't get into the point if you're not the best of the best. They were, um, so they were trained to look, observe, absorb, and copy. That 
you know, they, they really were exactly what you want. Um, it's the same thing with ballet dancers. Ballet dancers are trained to look, absorb, and copy. And uh, in this case, it was because, you know, I mean, they're learning how to field strip guns and uh, the battle tactics of the Spartans and trigonometry. And, and so they were really all working at a very high level. Um, so it was an incredible delight. I mean, it was, it was probably the pinnacle of the, the most perfect store, you know, storm of, of goodness a choreographer could ask for. Um, I mean, I've had a lot of experiences where I've had some really good people. I'm also, one of my things is I, because I've studied so many different things, I will, I can tell you if somebody's walking across the stage, what they'll be good at by how they move. Um, and I think, you know, most martial artists can recognize another martial artist by just how they move um, or how they position themselves in a room or how they, um, their attitude. There's a certain way you carry yourself um, in certain arts, certainly. And, um, and so I can look at somebody and go, okay, they're going to, they're not going to be good for, for punching, but I think they're going to be good grappler or I think they'll be good, you know, and, and I've been wrong sometimes, but generally I, I can peg it and I try to find what works for the actor. The trick is to find what makes them look the best in the role that they'll be the most comfortable with. Um, you know, you get an actor, say, like Keanu Reeves, who is willing to train hard as, as anything that he gets to the point where the, the stuntmen consider him one of them, you know, that, that he's up there with him. Um, and, you know, that's the gift from heaven for a, for a fight choreographer. He not do anything and or can't do anything. You work around it. You know, I mean, that's, uh, it's hard on stage, but on film, you can usually find a way to fake it. Um, but on stage, you know, I've done 60 Renaissance festivals and um, uh, everybody there has to be able to pull their weight because it's a long day. But if you're choreographing, say, Cyrano, usually they cast an actor who does not necessarily have sword work even though he's supposed to do this amazing sword fight. So Valvere, the guy he has the big duel at the beginning with, is usually, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, you bring in a ringer for him. You bring in a sword expert, uh, a really good stage combat guy, to make your Cyrano look good. And you build a rapport between the two of them, and you give Valver. you know, Cyrano just moves the sword to the left and the right, and Valver does all the physical stuff, so it looks like, Cyrano's so good he doesn't have to do anything, you know? Um, and, you know, that's, that's the other extreme of it where you just work around it. It's like, uh, if you see some of these old Broadway musicals um, where you'll see basically uh, an older actor or actress, they're walking in the middle and people are dancing around them, like on these old variety shows, and they're really not doing much because they can't, <laughs> you know? But if you dazzle them with everything around them, you, you know, you make them look good. Um, and that's really, you know, all you can do. That's the job. The job is to make it safe and make the actor look good. So, um, One of the things that we talk about on this show is the idea that stepping into learning a new skill and another martial art or a weapon or, or whatever is, is generally an advantage. You know, I, I feel strongly diversity Yes. in your martial arts experience as an asset. You've learned a lot of different things. So I would expect that you have, if not a system, at least an approach where you'll, you'll tackle a new weapon or a new fighting style. Uh, my first thing is I'm a white belt. I'm always a white belt. I, I really work very hard that if I'm learning from someone, like I just recently um, got a pistol certification. Um, it's something I always wanted to do. I've used long guns, but I'd never used pistols very often. Not real pistols. I'd used, you know, stage weapons. And I wanted the real certification. So um, uh, I, I did a course with a, a former Marine. Uh, and um, even though I've read a lot about it, and I've actually done lectures on uh, using weapons for writers, you know, what caliber 
this is a clip, this is a magazine, that kind of stuff. I literally approached it as if I knew absolutely nothing and just emptied my cup and, and um, took whatever he gave me because I had confidence that he really knew his stuff and he does. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a thing called Guns for Real. Uh, Charles Haskins uh, is the instructor, really, really good. At it. And um, I just always approach it as if I'm a white belt. I really don't try. I mean, every once in a while I might go, oh, wow, that's just like, um, but uh, not to say, oh, I know this, but like, oh, I, I kind of recognize that. That's cool. And keep myself empty. Um, because um, there's always something new to learn. There's always some nuance that somebody else has learned. Um, I'm a big believer that nobody should ever teach anything unless you've studied with three different teachers of that thing. So that, um, you know, one teacher might cancel the other out. But if there are three teachers, chances are you won't pick up the bad habits from any of them. Um, and you'll filter and you'll be a better teacher because you've seen other people's approaches from different angles. Um, but when I'm a student, I'm a white belt. I'm always a white belt. That takes yeah. quite the suspension of, of ego, which is something we're not all good at. Is that something that came innately to you? Um, no, I, I think it's, it's, it's a recognition of, I've been very lucky to study with people who really know a hell of a lot more than me. And um, the only reason I was able to learn from them was I did not tell them what I knew. I asked them what they knew. Um, I actually had a, a, an acquaintance who wanted to study sword with me and we did a class uh, and it's almost like you never want to, you know, doctors are not supposed to take care of their own family. Um, right. We did a class, but he kept, he'd never had a sword in his hand. He'd watched a lot of movies and stuff. He kept like saying, well, do it this way. And we do it that way. And so, you know, at the end of the class, it was cool. And I never asked him back for a class again because he didn't want to learn. He wanted to show what he knew. And, um, I think by then I already had this attitude, but that really crystallized it for me that if you're going to learn something, you can't show the teacher what you know. You have to see what the teacher knows. And, and um, I mean, ultimately, in terms of, of ego, the ego is if I'm good at something, I'll be good at it. Um, if I'm not good at it, what point... In, you know, um, no point in pretending I'm, I'm a, a heavyweight boxer because the second I get in the ring with a Tyson, I will be dead. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's it's almost like, you know, math is um, math is absolute. Fighting is absolute. You know, there's a yes and a no. You either can, you know, be taken out or not. State combat's a little different. You know, um, you can, there are 50 choices for how to block this. And um, mind you, I'm doing a block because I'm on radio. Um, of course. <laughs> I, I, you, just, you know, there's 50 choices on how to block this. The question doesn't become, what's the best choice? The question becomes, well, what will show off the actor better? What will look up better on camera or on stage? Um, so it's not an absolute. But in a fight, you know, you're knocked out or you're not. There's no bullshit about it. So I think martial arts in that way, uh, real martial arts, not necessarily competition, because I know they used to do things where, like, even if you miss, yell a like Kia Ke shout, and maybe the judges will think you hit them. I'm like, well, that's kind of if you want to win the competition as opposed to want to learn something. I mean, I actually was a terrible competitor because I never took competition seriously. I was always interested in like winning stuff. So I would do outrageous things just to see if it will work, you know? Um, and um, so I didn't, I didn't do very many competitions because uh, eventually Huang Do let us compete, but um, just within the schools because our stuff was too, 
gymnastics or other things. Um, like I, I did a serum, which is the Korean wrestling. It's kind of like sumo, um, but it's older. And, um, and I was the champ for the school, but it's just because I didn't take it seriously and because I wasn't hurting anybody. Um, but, yeah, you know, competitions are not fighting, you know, that competitions are sets of rules with specific things. And if that's what you want to do, you can be a winner at that. Um, I mean, you know, it's not like the old days with Chuck Norris and, and, and Superfoot Wallace where they were making full contact, you know, before there were pads. And it was absolute. You either knocked the guy out or you didn't, you know. Um, uh, anything short of that is not actually a test of martial arts. It's just a test of whether or not you can follow rules, you know. Um, mm. So um, I guess, you know, again, it comes back to the ego thing. If I, I want to learn stuff. So I've never been interested in belts or uh, or you know, certificates. I kind of just want to learn stuff. I figure all knowledge is cool. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons I became a writer. Uh, I had all this stuff in my head. I got to get out. Uh, and it gave me an excuse to do lots of research. Um, but hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's no point in having ego because ultimately there's always somebody bigger or stronger or faster. Um, or younger and um, or sneakier and you know so it's just learn cool stuff and do cool things and try to be a good person sounds like that could be the title of a of a biography <laughs> maybe yeah. maybe your autobiography <laughs> I, I i get the no, the closest i'll ever come to an autobiography is i did a, a murder mystery called murder most fair and uh, it's about a fight choreographer putting on a Renaissance fair whose best friend is murdered and he has to solve the, the murder. And about 75% of the book is real. And because um, I don't think my life is all that interesting necessarily, but you know, once I put it in a context like that, it sounds interesting. Um, um, I just, you know, I, I think other people who do other stuff are fascinating to me. So, I mean, uh, I, um, it's just, it's life, you know, just life. I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm still alive. I have friends who are not. Um, most of my parts work at my age and, um, some of my friends not. I've had a, a good stuntman buddy of mine who had a stroke, uh, seven years ago, eight years ago. And, um, just woke up one day and his whole left side didn't work. Um, and uh, since then, he's actually like directed a bunch of web series and, you know, um, it's been a great inspiration. The fact is, is that that could happen to anybody, you know, and because um, he was a guy in great shape. So I consider myself lucky every day I wake up and take a breath and there's an opportunity to do cool stuff and learn new things. So I don't take, I don't take life for granted. That's good. I, I don't, I, I don't think anybody should. I'm, I know too many people do and hopefully few of those people are listening today. And if anyone out there is taking their life for granted, uh, stop, stop right now. <laughs> stop. Come right now. <laughs> well, come and get you. Well, if you could. Resume to prove it. That's right. <laughs> If you could work with, if you could do a scene with any martial artist, there's a slight twist of a question that we ask often. Any martial artist from any, you know, alive today, somebody who passed away, you know, anywhere in the world, you know, you had a time machine, we could bring somebody back and we could put them on stage or on film with you. Who would you want to work with? I, that's a two-part question. One is if it was somebody who was alive, it's a, it's a toss-up between Michael Jai White and Wesley Snipes. In either case, they would kill me because obviously I'm the big scary white guy. Um, and, um, but I respect both men so much as martial artists and as actors. Um, 
that it would be <laughs> it would be an honor to get my clock cleaned by him. <laughs> um, you know, um, I do. You know, and in terms of anyone who existed, um, I'd love to do a fight scene with Jock Mahoney. Um, great stuntman actor. Um, uh, and um, I guess that's a name that doesn't ring a bell for me. So can, can, uh, you, can you tell it, us a bit uh, about him? It's sort of an, an inside name. He was Sally Field's stepfather, but he was uh, he was Tarzan in a couple of films, which weren't his best actually. But he was a a, a, a stunt man who came into his own in the late nineteen forties, doubling Errol Flynn, and uh, eventually had his own career doing mostly westerns, but. Um, he doubled people for, for many years and then did, did these Westerns and stuff. Um, was a great physical guy. Um, and, um, had a TV series called the range rider where he did these incredible fight scenes, you know, on a, on a, on a low budget weekly basis. Um, uh, I guess the other one would be maybe Shokasugi. I, I love the work he did through the master and, um, and of course, I mean, Bruce Lee, but Bruce Lee is just somebody that like, I, you know, I have to get in a really long line to get to fight him. Um, you know, um, and I would have loved to have done a sword fight with, with Gene Kelly. Hmm. Uh, now people don't think of him as a martial artist. Oh. But he was, you know, his three musketeers, his physicality in that is so brilliant. Um, and, you know, again, being a ballet dancer and actually in every kind of dancer, but he could do anything. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, and of course, Errol Flynn, who's the guy I'm still trying to be. Or Guy Williams. Guy Williams, who was Zorro on the TV series. Oh, okay. Uh, he did, he did uh, a good portion, probably 70% of uh, the action on it. All of the sword fights were him. Um, the only time they double him was when he was jumping off stuff or, you know, some of the horse stuff, Ronnie Rundell. But um, that was one of the influences me as a kid, you know. Um, but yeah, but these days, you know, I mean, I'm working with um, Sensei Mo um, on a film right now. I'm, I'm playing the bad guy, of course. Um, and uh, it's being distributed by Wesley Snipes' company. And so in the back of my mind, there's a hope that the next film Wesley and him might actually be in and I might get to be in. So there's a reasonable chance that I could get myself, you know, beaten up by Wesley Snipes in the next film. Oh, that'd be awesome. And, and yeah, so that cool. would be, you know, I used to go when I was 15, I'd go to Chinatown to see movies before they came anywhere else. And, and so, I mean, I just, I just played, I'm playing them. Uh, one of the main bad guys in this movie called blood mix. But, um, I talked my way into being, you know, the end fight where the hero has to fight his way through, you know, 30 guys before he yeah. gets to you. I talked my way into being two of those guys under masks. <laughs> just so I could be in that long fight. So how like, how to? Different, <laughs> different, different costume? Yeah, different costumes is different guys, you know. Um, and I mean, I got, you know, I got shot. And, and, but I got to be part of the big fight. That was kind of the 15-year-old me went, hee, <laughs> Um, you know, cause the rest of the time I'm the, I'm the great bad guy in the film, you know, I'm, I'm the, the guy who haunts him through his, his nightmares and, uh, Master Crow. And, um, so it's a very solemn, you know, and there's no physicality in that. That's just after me, but this, this, I got to do the physical stuff. So it was, it was fun, um, to add that to finally, like, you know, one of my long list of, of like bucket list things. You know, all the years I've been doing stunts, I've never gone through a window. I've gone through open windows. I've jumped out. But I've never, like, crashed through a window. That's on my bucket list of things to do. Um, you know. <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe Wesley Snipes can be the one to throw you through the window. I could, I could you know, get two, two birds with one stone. He could kick my ass through a, <laughs> a <laughs> <crash> window. <laughs> That'd be perfect. I'd be fine with that. I'm doing a Western later this year. So, um you know, I'm, I'm getting some of my other bucket list items off. A guy from Brooklyn getting into a Western is kind of cool. That is, uh, that's yeah. really cool. You know, 
Do you have a favorite fight scene? Wow. Um, favorite favorite sword fight is the final sword fight in the Tyrone Power Mark of Zorro, bar none. It's just a brilliantly choreographed fight. Um, favorite unarmed? Um, wow. Um, I'd have to say at this point that the elevator fight in um, in Winter Soldier, Captain America Winter Soldier, mm. brilliantly choreographed. Everything in that fight told you something about the characters. And at the same time, it was really exciting. Um, uh, and, um, and I think the, the Chuck Norris fight in Way of the Dragon, because it really, uh, again, it was a story. It told you what you needed to know about the characters and advanced the plot at the same time. So it's kind of perfect. That's really cool. You've told us about some of your upcoming projects, but if we look out a little further, you know, you've told us, you know, bucket list items and who you want to work with and films you got coming up, but are there, are there bigger goals? Are there, you know, is there, is there a weapon that you're, you're working on learning? Is there an art that you want to learn? You know, you, you don't sound like somebody who's sitting on their laurels ever. I mean, you talk no, describe I, yourself I, at the I, beginning I, as I a type A. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually, I have two books coming out, um, with a character called John shadows, which I'm calling martial arts noir because he's, um, uh, it's their detective books, but he is the son of a Kunyoshi who was an assassin for the emperor during world war two. And, um, so the martial arts are very much a part of the story. If you can imagine, you know, Mike hammer, um, and Shokasugi in one character, um, and those are coming out, and I, I kind of hope they will, they will get some visibility. Um, and uh, I'm actually, I'm, I want to start studying Sambo. I've been waiting. I have a, a stint in from a sinus infection, and uh, I had planned to start earlier, but they wanted to leave it in for six months. So I'm hoping to start that later this year because I don't have a lot of grappling. And uh, I would like to, to learn some – I prefer – locks to to strikes when it comes to fighting um and so i'd like to learn a little bit more inside stuff about and i think sambo is an incredibly uh efficient art um and um yeah i mean that's that's and it, like i said i i i'm doing this western and i'm in the back of my mind Remember the first first John Wick film? He comes yeah, up to Thor at the door and goes, "How are you doing, Francis?" And he has the gun at the guy's head. I want that role in one of the future John Wick movies. <laughs> 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 I would love to be um, a guy who John Wick takes out, preferably after some dialogue. That's sort of my. That's one of my uh, put it into the universe goals. You know. Um, because I think those films are brilliant. They, Who would they, have ever thought that an actor from Bill and Ted would become someone that we talk about so often on this show? I know. It's a testament to someone who has opened himself to learning. You know, when you look at, even you look at him now compared to the stuff he did in Matrix, he is what martial arts are. It's a, a, a learning curve that goes on forever. You know, um, it's astounding. I know it's, it's, you know, it's the reverse. You had Chuck Norris learning how to act, kind of, um, you know, and all of these actors, all these martial artists learning how to be actors. And now we have it the other way around. Yeah. And I, I I'm excited to see Matrix 4 with his, you know, dramatically yeah. improved martial arts skills. Yeah, I know. It's, it's going to be really interesting. I mean, I, I think it's a movie that doesn't need to be made, but I'll go see it. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Oh, I, I think we all, I, I think that's probably everyone's summary. This movie doesn't have to happen, but I'm going to watch it anyway, because yeah, exactly. how can I turn it down? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if people want to find you online, you know, check out the books that you've got or upcoming projects or anything like that, you know, website, social media, any of that stuff, what, what do you website, have for us? The urban swashbuckler.com. And Ooh, that's I like that. my blog. Um, 
Uh, I actually, this, this one of my goals this year is redoing the website too. It's a couple years old, but, uh, and I'm on Amazon, Teal James Glenn, um, double E, no way. Um, that's, uh, I've got pages on Amazon with my stuff. I've got books coming out this year. Um, so, you know, they can find me. I, I can't hide. I've often said I'm, I'm distinctive enough that no matter how many pantyhose I put over my head, the guy in the bodega will say, no, the robber was TJ. It was that guy. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I can be found. That's phenomenal. I thank you for coming on. Thanks for your time. And I'd like thank for you, you to pick how you're going to send us out. You know, I, I asked the guest, you know, words of wisdom or, or anything like that. You know, how would, how do you want to close up this episode? Be as kind to yourself as you want people to be kind to other people. Most people don't know how to be kind to themselves. Whew, what a ride that one was. I had so much fun. I can't tell you how exciting it is. Here we are close to five years in and I still get to talk to these amazing people who share these amazing stories and get me fired up about training. I mean, what's better than that? As I keep saying, I have the best job in the world. So, sir, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing everything. And just thanks for being so open. I had a blast. If you want to check out everything from this or other episodes, bottom line, if you want more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There you can find the videos and links and social media and pictures and more. And we're constantly looking at ways to improve the website. So if you haven't checked it out in a while, head on over. There's probably new stuff that we've added since you've been there last. If you're down to support us and all of our work, you have lots of options. Use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% at whistlekick.com or leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help with the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. And I hope that if you see some whistle kick apparel out in the wild, you'll introduce yourself. Let's build a global community of traditional martial artists who support each other and support training and support cross training. I think you know what we stand for five years in. And if you have suggestions for guests or topics or anything like that, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com and make sure you're following our social media. At Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. And that's it. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.